This is CBC Here and Now. After two smash and grabs, police are searching for the backhoe bandits. If you're robbing places, you're in and out. You don't be a first timer doing this. An expansion plan to retain new immigrants. We're really making it easier for people to put down roots and actually make smaller communities their home. Delivering soon, the province promises midwives in 2018. With the idea that staff would be on the ground in the fall. A big storm heading our way later this week. It'll bring snow and rain and a brief warm up. Details just ahead. Our top story tonight, police are trying to solve a pair of brazen robberies where backhoes were used to smash into local businesses. Yeah, on New Year's Day, drugs were stolen from a pharmacy in St. John's. A few days earlier, an ATM was stolen from a pharmacy in Paradise. As here now, Zach Gowdy tells us the robberies have one big thing in common. They say you need the right tool for the job. Well, when the job is a smash and grab burglary, a backhoe is about the best tool you could have, if you know how to use it. Well, you'd have to have, to me, prior knowledge of how a backhoe operates. Like, take someone off Camelot Road, I don't think it, you'd be doing it quite so simple. Whether they were backhoe pros or amateurs, someone used one to do this on New Year's Day. Police say a backhoe was stolen from Elizabeth Avenue, driven all the way here to Dominion on Black Marsh Road, and then used to rip open the window of the store's drive through pharmacy. The thieves got away with narcotics. Now, this is the second time in a week that someone has used a backhoe to break into a business, which raises the question, is the person who did this a serial backhoe bandit or a copycat? Just a few days earlier, another backhoe was used to rip open the wall at Lawton's Drugs in Paradise and steal an ATM machine. For now, police aren't saying if the two incidents are connected. They're not exactly precision break-ins, but even turning the machine on would likely require some experience. If you're robbing places, you're in and out. You, you don't be a first-timer doing this. In a notorious heist in 2007, thieves used a stolen backhoe to break into a gas station. But security footage revealed the culprit wasn't exactly a skilled operator. He almost tipped the machine over with his first swing. There are dozens, if not hundreds, of backhoes sitting unsupervised in parking lots everywhere. Most can be started with a simple master key that fits similar makes and models. They also have other security features like kill switches and combination locks. But like the locks on your car, whether those are in use is up to the driver. So if they want their machine secure, well, they can make it secure. Don't leave keys in it, right? Zach Gowdy, CBC News, St. John's. Parents are frustrated that they still can't get a midwife in Newfoundland and Labrador. The province says a change is coming, but a new mother says her child's parking lot birth could have been avoided if the government had acted more quickly. Here now's Mark Quinn has the story. This is Carla DeVoe. She's not even a month old, but she's already a TV star. That's because her birth made the news. Her mother had only seconds to collect her thoughts before it happened. Really, is this... This is what we're going to do. Like, we're going to just have a baby here in a parking lot. And I just thought about it. And I was like, well, we can't keep driving. It's, you know, it wouldn't be safe. Carla was born in the back seat of a car in a parking lot near the village mall. Everything worked out. In fact, she's perfect. But her mother says the drama of Carla's birth was avoidable. Had we just gone upstairs, it would have been a lot more comfortable. Um, but we didn't have that option. The DeVoe's second child, Elsie, also came quickly. Her parents just barely made it to the hospital for her birth. This time, the DeVos wanted to have a home birth, but they were disappointed. They tried, but couldn't find a midwife. Here at the Confederation Building, they've been working on this problem for more than a decade. Last year, legislation was adopted to make midwives part of the health care system. And last fall, a consultant was hired to figure out exactly how to do that. We came here to the West Block to see where things stand now. The health minister tells us the province is expected to start hiring midwives soon. 
job postings uh, in the spring of next year with the idea that staff would be on the ground in the fall of next year uh, as part of an integrated pilot initially in Gander. If everything goes as planned, midwives will be working across the province by 2019. Too late for Nicole DeVoe, who says she's had her last baby. But maybe someday, young Carla will start a family in the comfort of her own home with the help of a midwife. Mark Quinn, CBC News, St. John's. Well, about $40 million of federal, private and provincial money is being poured into the province's broadband internet services. The announcement was made by MP Seamus O'Regan at the rooms in St. John's today. It's part of the Connect to Innovate program aimed at building affordable high-speed internet across rural areas. About 1,500 homes in rural Newfoundland and Labrador will be brought online in 70 communities. That will mean that 99% of the province will have access to broadband internet. This is a real investment in what we call the new wharf, the new road. People, when they move to communities these days, want to know what the internet speed is. You know, that's, that's, that's kind of like, well, I'll decide now whether I want to live there. For many people, it allows them to stay home and thrive. And that's what we want. We want people to be able to stay where they want to live, at home, and thrive. Thanks, but no thanks. Former Premier Danny Williams says he has no interest in re-entering political life. Now, rumours over the holiday led to speculation that a draft Danny Williams campaign was underway. Williams says it's not true. Today he issued a statement to put the matter to rest. He said, I'm very humbled by those who have asked me to re-enter political life. However, I served my 10 years and am now solely focused on contributing to our province from the private sector. Marble Mountain should open to skiers and snowboarders later this week. A lot of snow has fallen on the slopes, but wind caused some of it to drift, leaving bare areas. The ski hill was supposed to open New Year's Day, but the weather didn't cooperate. Staff are taking advantage of the colder temperatures of late, though, and operating snow guns to create the white stuff. Several more centimeters are needed before it's safe to hit the hill. While on the other side of the province, White Hills Ski Resort is also preparing to start the season. Right now, opening day is planned for this coming Saturday, January 6th. But like all things snow-related, that's weather permitting, of course. We found a and there might not be enough snow for the ski hills, but there was definitely too much for this moose. A group of snowmobilers with sled core came across the distressed beast on New Year's Eve just outside Grossmore National Park. Jonathan Anstey said he and his friends were digging for about 15 minutes before the animal finally got free. After that, the moose just trotted away. And that's certainly one lucky moose. Oh, yeah. Close to them for doing that. What a great video. Imagine all that snow there, and in one part of the province, they're making it. <laughs> so, right. so we can ski. Well, not me, but <laughs> other people. Can. I'm banned from skiing. Banned from skiing? <laughs> well, they have a, a wing named after me at Western Memorial. So <laughs> I've been there a couple of times from skiing. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> Probably yes. better than that. Uh, you in, enjoy it from inside. Absolutely. Yeah. Just yeah. the après ski. And, you know, more snow coming to uh, later this week. Apparently a, lots. Yes, a big storm is on the way, as I mentioned right off the top there. So uh, we'll be keeping an eye on that for sure. And uh, why don't we start with uh, looking at some of the cold temperatures right now. This is the current wind chill for the province. And I always like to look at this because it really gives you a sense of how cold it feels outside. On the island, we're looking at a wind chill, you know, around minus 8 in St. John's, minus 10 in Cornerbrook, but Labrador City, minus 25. So it is cold. And uh, this is how things are going to pan out for the next uh, 24 hours or so. You can see we have lots of uh, flurries on the island and in Labrador, and those flurries will persist throughout the evening and throughout tomorrow. Not significant uh, accumulation anywhere. Labrador City could see about uh, two centimeters of snow, so really not much at all. Tomorrow we're looking at a very similar day to today. Uh, so yes, we have a chance of flurries for pretty much everywhere across the uh, province, except for uh, coastal Labrador there, a mix of sun and cloud in Maine, a minus six there. So temperature's not too bad, but we do have this uh, special weather statement in effect now. This is for 
Thursday night. So Thursday night into Friday, and it's because of this beast of a system that is coming up towards the province. It's going to bring snow in the island and on Labrador, and then it's going to bring a wave of rain. So I'll get into more detail about that a little bit later. But now we're going to head outside to Bannerman Park in St. John's, and that's where uh, the popular skating spot known as the Loop is. And it's a big hit over uh, the past few winters, but this year it's off to a little bit of a bumpy start. Uh, Jeremy Eaton is there right now. So, Jeremy, how is the ice? Well, uh, Carolyn, not sure if you can see behind us, but there are a number of people out uh, skating laps. Uh, so it can still draw a crowd here at the Loop, uh, even if the ice isn't in the best condition that it's ever been. So I was out here earlier today, and lots of folks in St. John's take advantage of the sunshiny day that we had, but the ice isn't in mid-season form just yet. So poor weather slowed down the efforts to get the loop up and running, but work continues to flatten out a few ruts in the ice. So city crews are working on smoothing out the skating surface, something that city councillor Jamie Korab says will continue. They'll keep updating that or keep fixing those as we go. Uh, it's not like a pothole out, um, you know, on the roads where you just put some asphalt over it. You can't just fill it up with water, so you've got to do it in, in different sessions. So it could take a day or two to fill some of these potholes, if you want to call it, or dips. Um, but uh, they will be fixed, and uh, you want it to be safe out here. But they do put up pylons to make sure people don't uh, fall into them. So I uh, just took a walk around the loop earlier, so some of those ruts are still there, but a lot of them sort of have been filled in, so it's pretty smooth here now. But Korab says staff are out for two hours every day trying to uh, improve the surface here behind us, and they maintain it throughout the day. So I'm going to continue to hang out here at the loop, and uh, hopefully we can hear from some skaters later on the show to get their two cents. Reporting live from Benjamin Park in St. John's, I'm Jeremy Eaton for Here and Now. Well, it's pretty much an institution in St. John's, China House Restaurant in the Torbay Mall. Well, they've been serving up Asian dishes for more than 40 years, but how did they get their start? Yes, uh, tonight here and now brings you the story of how the restaurant reunited a family and sparked a second business to open in downtown St. John's. My name is uh, Sandy Tan. This is my husband, uh, Nam San Chung. We own the China House Restaurant. I told my husband my brother want to retire, so I told my husband, why don't we yeah, take over the restaurant and our family can yeah, get together. Hi, my name is Leon. My name is Erich. We are the Chung Bros. And we're the owners of Morganopoly. When me and my brother took uh, Morganopoly, or when we started Morganopoly, we had no idea how to operate a coffee shop. We had no idea how to make uh, espresso or, 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 or lattes. And then, honestly, like my dad's such a huge inspiration to us. Like, it, it's not too late to start over. As a, as a son of uh, an immigrant, um, me and my brother, we, we kind of understand how hard it is to, to go to a completely foreign, foreign land with no friends. Uh, and, and I think um, this is a good way to, to help newcomers to Canada. I'm hungry now. Uh, me too. <laughs> it looked delicious. And, and especially because Ariana Kellen, who put that together, didn't bring any back for the rest of us. So, mm. you know. Check the fortune cookie. <laughs> <laughs> but this province is trying to attract more immigrants to come and stay in this province. And it's not just St. John's. Later in the show, I'm going to chat with the Association for New Canadians about why they're opening offices outside of the overpass. It looks like fun and it's very inviting, but when is the ice safe? When is it not? We'll find out coming up on Here and Now.
Welcome back to Here and Now. A close call involving three snowmobilers who went through the ice on New Year's Eve has prompted a warning about ice safety from the RCMP. It happened near Island Pond near Lewisport. The water was shallow, so all three were able to walk out of the ice and back to shore. And just this afternoon, a man walking his dog on Virginia Lake in the east end of St. John's went through the ice. He also made it out unharmed. It's that time of year when you may not be sure if the ice is safe. That's why we decided to check in with the Red Cross for a few ice safety reminders. So Jillian, what are the guidelines for ice safety? When is it safe to get out on here? Absolutely. The Canadian Red Cross has published a lot of information about ice safety on our website at www.redcross.ca forward slash ice safety. As a general rule of thumb, we encourage people to check for ice thickness of 15 centimeters for walking or skating alone. 20 centimeters for skating or walking in groups, that could be a hockey game, and then 25 centimeters to go out on the ice in a skidoo. Lots of people though just think, okay, I'm just gonna just drive straight across yeah. this on a skidoo. Some people run into trouble, what have you. Uh, yeah. How do you, you can't check every, uh, is that unrealistic? We do ask that people check several locations in one body of water uh, for ice thickness. Some things to look for are clear blue ice, that's going to be your safest ice, the thickest ice that you'll find. And then a kind of cloudy ice that indicates that there's been some freeze and melt, but it's still pretty solid. Then you have your gray ice and that has running water underneath. Uh, some areas to look at are how far you are from shore, because that will affect ice thickness, as well as if there's a current coming in or out of the area and how deep the water is underneath the ice. So those are things to keep in mind. Those are some kind of quick cues to, you know, is this ice safe for me to be on? Now this ice is covered in snow, as you can see. Yes. Uh, it was clear the other day, but now we've had a snowfall. You can see where we cleared a rink earlier. Absolutely. Uh, how do you approach this? Because now we've come out and it's it's slushy. Underneath. Yes. There's, there's a lot of slush here. Is it still safe, do you think? Well, I would say that over there, it was a lot more white ice, and that was a lot more safe than the ice that's behind us. And I would say that would be unsafe because it's gray. There's always the possibility that that ice will collapse. Is it possible that ice in one area is okay and nearby not? Absolutely, and that's why we encourage people to check several areas in one body of water because the thickness of ice can vary from right just where we were standing a few minutes to go to right here. That's a distance of 10 feet. So if somebody goes in, what's the first thing you do? First thing you should always do in an emergency is call 911. Um, that's what we recommend in all of our life-saving courses. After that, you know, you need to assess the situation. You need to make sure that you yourself are safe. You know, you can't help somebody else if you can't help yourself first. You want to make sure that you're not going to go in the water. You may consider reaching out something like a hockey stick, a branch, or a rope to somebody who's in the water and spreading your own weight out, so that, such as lying down on the ice, so that you're not at risk of going in yourself. But I would have to say the most important thing to do is to always call 911 or have somebody else go for help um, in the event that you yourself become incapacitated. What's your advice to people who may venture out alone? My advice is to let people know where you're going. Um, have a way to communicate with people if you have cell phone coverage and let people know when you expect to be back. Uh, and then when, you, when you're out, you're out in the woods, you know, you're dirt across the pond to go have a boil up or something, you know, check the ice before you go out. It's the most important thing that you can do, really. Jillian, thanks for your time. Appreciate it. Of course. Well, so glad to hear that so far the two incidents that we have had have had happy endings, but Absolutely. we know from past years that's not always the case. And because on the Avalon uh, you get the weather fluctuations, that's why you can run into some trouble where it's safe for a little while, then we get rain or warmer temperatures, and it changes. Of course, then folks who maybe travel on sea ice aren't quite sure at night, so it's just, it, just be very careful. Absolutely. Well, staying on top of the ice is one thing, jumping into icy water on purpose? Well, we'll tell you about the Polar Bear Dippers coming up next.
Welcome back, everyone. Well, we know the water on this side of the country is cold at the best of times, but how about swimming? at this time of year. Oh my goodness. Yes, uh, if the recent weather has left you feeling a little bit cold, just wait until you see this video. <laughs> Look at this. <laughs> oh my goodness, this is how uh, Byron Osmond welcomed 2018 by jumping in Conception Bay from St. Philip's Wharf. Yeah, and he wasn't alone. Chris Bragg, Matt Kelly, Jeremy Rogers, and Damian Drover also took the plunge. Now, Osmond and Bragg uh, started this tradition three years ago after losing their fathers the previous year. They wanted to start each year by living life to the fullest. And Ooh. did they ever? <laughs> life to the coldest. Yeah, and they weren't the only ones uh, going for a bit of a polar dive. This is uh, <laughs> Micah having a blast just jumping through all the freshly fallen snow. Yeah, Ashley Han shot this video this morning on the West Coast where they have quite a bit of snow near the Humber River. And is Micah looking for a bone under there or just playing hide and seek? <laughs> Determined to find that toy missing since uh, the fall. <laughs> but uh, that definitely one creature who's very happy to see all that oh, snow. Yeah, <laughs> looks so happy bouncing through the snow. Sweet. Yeah, and... Uh, well, will we be saying the same on Friday? <laughs> <laughs> will we be happily bouncing through the yeah, snow? Yeah, the Maritimes, there looks like they're oh. going to get a big bullseye on them it's from this system. It's going to hit them harder, and then it's coming to us. So we're going to need our it. snow boots, and then we're going to need our rubber boots, basically. And strong winds as well. Really strong winds, so it's going to be a bit of a, a messy mix the end of the week. Um, so why don't we just get to uh, You get to get deliver right it all, to all the good news. Lucky. Here we go. Woohoo! <laughs> so uh, here's a look at the headlines, a little summary of what's to come. So as I just mentioned, Thursday night, the snowstorm will... Uh, come to the island. So it's all going to get underway on Thursday evening. And then uh, overnight, it's going to turn to rain on the island. And those winds are really going to be howling. And uh, for Labrador, they're not going to get that uh, snow to rain changeover. They're just going to stick with the snow the whole time. So uh, yeah, they're in for a bit of a heavy snowfall there. Not like they're not used to it, of course. So here's uh, the picture right now. You can see uh, on the Avalon Peninsula, we've been getting these scattered flurries throughout the day and that should continue into tonight and throughout tomorrow on the west coast this little system has just been hovering over the gross morn area just bringing about 20 centimeters of snow there today so it's just been kind of sitting there and because of that there is a snowfall warning in effect but uh, not expected for that uh, that that will last much longer tonight about five more centimeters of snow expected in that area here's the picture for uh, tonight into tomorrow tomorrow fairly calm and quiet over the next few days. You can see a lot of flurries here, but no significant uh, accumulation anywhere. Going to be clear for a lot of the island. Uh, chance of flurries right across temperatures in the, you know, minus seven, minus eight, minus two in St. Anth Anthony uh, up in Labrador. Clear along the coast there, a bit of sun for Nain and uh, some flurries for Labrador City in minus 15. Going to feel more like minus 30 there tomorrow. So very, very cold. Um, and as you can see here, Thursday morning, clear almost everywhere. We have a bit of a flurry action there over the northern peninsula starting off Thursday, but this is when things really start to take a turn. This is Thursday afternoon. You can see the system just making its way towards the province. So Thursday up until that point is going to be quite nice on the island, a mix of sun and cloud uh, for the east and central. Those flurries will be starting a little bit earlier on the west coast there and uh, fairly clear in Labrador as well on Thursday. And then we get into this. This is the special weather statement that uh, Environment Canada has in place for the entire island. Uh, so that's for the winds and for the snow and for the rain. And you can see how this is going to play out. You can see the snow moving up here. Labrador City is going to get it fairly early as well. So that wave of snow is going to come up through. It's going to be very, very cold, windy and snowy. And then it's going to change over. You can see Friday morning. Uh, that's when the rain is really going to set in and uh, temperatures are going to take a spike upwards too, which is kind of nice, um, but still it's going to be stormy. So, uh, and we have all of that snow for Labrador. You can see they're not going to be getting that changeover. So this is the picture for Friday, a real mess on the island, a mess for everyone. Uh, and you can see the temperatures going up to six degrees 
on the island uh, for the east and central. A little bit cooler on the west. Lab City keeping those uh, cold temperatures minus 15 there. So overall, it's going to be a pretty, pretty uh, messy start to the weekend. Fred? Thank you, Carolyn. 2018 could be an extraordinary year at Supreme Court in St. John's. There could be as many as six murder trials, the first beginning early in the new year. Here and now's Glenn Payette has this look at what's ahead. It was a startling picture, a body being removed from the back of the Harborview Apartments in St. John's on May 9, 2016. It was the body of Marcel Reardon, who had apparently been clubbed to death. Perhaps more startling was the woman arrested and charged with the murder, Ann Norris, an accomplished athlete in karate and basketball. Hers will be the first murder trial of the new year at Supreme Court in St. John's. It's slated to begin January 15th and go for five weeks. Jumping ahead to March, Stephen Neville will face a second trial charged with the murder of Doug Flynn and attempted murder of Ryan Dwyer in Paradise in October of 2010. Neville was tried and sentenced to 12 years, but on appeal, the Supreme Court of Canada ordered a new trial. It said that the original judge had given some confusing instructions to the jury. Neville's new trial is set for 10 weeks, beginning March 5th. And later in March, on the 25th, Trent Budd is scheduled to go on trial charged with the first-degree murder of his five-year-old daughter, Quinn, in April of 2016 in Carbonear. He's also accused of arson for setting fire to the family home. His trial is slated for eight weeks. Paul Connolly is slated for a six-week trial for the first-degree murder of Stephen Miller in CBS in July of 2016. Two other men, Chesley Lucas and Calvin Kenny, have pleaded guilty to manslaughter in that case. Last week, a judge rejected a joint submission of seven and a half years in prison for each of them. Because of a publication ban, we can't give the judges reasons. And there are two other murder cases that could end up at Supreme Court in St. John's. The preliminary hearing will resume in March for Ellen Potter and Daniel Leonard, accused of killing Dale Porter in North River in 2014. And just this past September, Craig Pope was charged with second-degree murder in the stabbing death of David Collins in the Mundy Pond area of St. John's. Pope is back in court January 4th. So why so busy in 2018? There are a number of factors, including a small spike in killings in 2016 and the Jordan decision, which says trials must take place in a timely manner. So if you live in the St. John's area, don't be surprised if you get a summons for jury duty. Well, there are usually only 12 people on a jury. Often hundreds are summoned to take part in the jury selection process. Glenn Pay at CBC News, St. John's. The province is trying to keep more immigrants who come to Newfoundland and Labrador. We'll find out how new offices for the Association for New Canadians could help.
Welcome back to Here and Now. The province is beefing up the services to help immigrants settle and stay here. Today, government announced it's looking for innovative ways to help refugees get into the workplace. It's also helping the Association for New Canadians open offices in Cornerbrook, Labrador City, Happy Valley Goose Bay, as well as in Central. What sort of services are these new offices going to be able to provide that you're not able to provide right now based just in St. John's? Well, the services will be very wide ranging. Settlement can often be a complicated issue. It involves lots of different parts. Um, so it will include things like helping people find a place to live, helping them find employment, uh, working with other partners on the ground in terms of cultural issues and uh, sensitivity issues around those kinds of things. When we look at the statistics, it's showing right now after about three years, a third of the immigrants end up leaving the province. How much of that is because of a lack of services in some of these areas? Well, the statistics can be a little bit misleading. It really depends on what length of time you're looking at. It depends on what other groups you may be comparing it to. Many Newfoundlanders and Labradorians, of course, uh, move to other parts of the country for work. So you need to disentangle that issue. But ultimately, what it comes down to is people are more likely to put down roots in a community if they have stronger settlement uh, supports, stronger settlement services like what we'll be offering through these offices. And it's also important to note as well that this is building on services that already exist in different parts of the province. Uh, the Association for New Canadians delivers various programs on an outreach basis right now in all parts of the province. This will boost our ability to provide uh, a similar or equal quality of service right across the province at lower cost. How big of an opportunity do you think there is to try and address this issue of declining populations in the rest of the province by making it more um, favorable, I guess, for immigrants to move to some of the smaller, more rural areas of the province? Yeah, you're right to note that there are some strong demographic trends that we need to be aware of. The Harris Center put out a study recently that sh uh, showed that there could be as much as 40,000 people leaving smaller communities uh, across the island, either for St. John's or parts uh, on the mainland. So I think it shows um, really where the opportunity is in immigration, not just in boosting the, the demography of the province and making you know some of these smaller communities uh, in some ways, uh, you know, uh, boosting their population there, but also boosting services, starting businesses, starting families. And so by establishing offices in all of the major regions of the province, we're really making it easier for people to put down roots and actually make smaller communities their home. When I've talked to some of the people who've decided to leave the province, one of the issues that you hear from immigrants is often not around services, but around community. The idea that they may have a cousin who already lives in Toronto, or there's already an established community in larger cities in the rest of Canada that they can feel that they're more a part of. How do you tackle that problem? Right, there are typically two major reasons why people uh, may decide to leave the province. One is because they've got family relations in other parts of the country, and the other is simply for work. And I think these are two issues that all Newfoundlanders and Labradorians can really identify with. So the idea behind providing stronger settlement services is to help connect people and newcomers in particular with opportunities that may already exist within those communities across the province, but that may, may not be necessarily as obvious as you would think. Okay, well, thank you very much for coming in. Yeah, thanks for your time. So it may be uh, cold, well actually I may be cold outside, but uh, the loop here is starting to heat up. Uh, we'll talk to a couple of skaters coming up after the break.
Today we have not one but two young athletes to introduce. Matthew and Alex Gillingham of Rogers Cove Gander Bay are nine and seven years old. Yeah, they both spent last summer playing baseball with the Stephenville Minor Baseball and Softball programs and swimming lessons from the Stephenville Aqua Aquatic Center. rather. Oh, congratulations, Matthew and Alex. You are today's Young Athletes of the Day. And Carolyn, before we get to the weather, we've got some great news to tell you about this evening. Uh, the votes are in and a Newfoundland athlete's performance has been selected as CBC's top Canadian sports moment from 2017. Yes, Caitlin Osmond, along with Toronto's Gabrielle Daleman, have both been recognized for making history at the Figure Skating World Championships last March. The skaters were the first Canadian women to each win medals at the same event. Osmond took home the silver, Daleman got the bronze. Nice, and uh, here's a look back at that. What a great moment for both of them to be recognized, not only get the medals, but now recognized mm -hmm. as one of the top sports moments for the entire country for this year. Wow. Yeah, and the Brad Guju, of course, uh, they won the Briar here in St. John's. That made it to the list of the top 10 finalists. Mm, and yeah. I was looking at some of the top sports stories from last year. Katerina Roxon, of course, won a medal right. at the Special Olympics. So yeah, a lot right. of success for yeah. uh, Newfoundland Labrador athletes. Punching above our weight. There you go, <laughs> as usual. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, we've, uh, we've all been talking about how cold it's been in other parts <laughs> of uh, the country. So I thought we'd start the weather just by looking at some current temperatures across uh, Canada. I always like to see how we stack up temperature-wise uh, compared to other parts of Canada. And you can see we're at minus four right now. Uh, but some really chilly places. Uh, Winnipeg is at minus 16, Montreal minus 14. A lot of record breaking cold temperatures over the past few days in many parts of the country. Here are our current temperatures for the province right now. Not too bad on the island. We're looking at temperatures between minus six and minus two. Uh, Labrador, of course, is still very cold. Minus 19 right now, much colder with that wind chill. And chilly along the uh, the coast of Labrador as well. So I mentioned the system a, a bit earlier, bringing lots of snow to the west coast, and there's still a snowfall warning in effect for the Gross Morn area. That's not expected to last much longer. All, most of the snow has already come down, so about five more centimeters expected uh, over the next few hours. So. This is a snapshot of the next 48 hours. Not a whole lot happening in the next 48 hours. A lot of uh, flurry action across the island, but no significant accum accumulation anywhere. We're looking at two to four centimeters in, in most places. So pretty quiet. It's almost like the calm before the storm as we head into Thursday. So there is a special weather statement in effect from Environment Canada for the entire island warning about those winds, snow and rain that's on the way. So Thursday is going to be fairly quiet in terms of precipitation until it gets later in the day when that system uh, starts to move up towards the island. So you can see that band of snow, uh, not too sure on amounts yet, but uh, heavy snowfall in the west could be upwards of 30 centimeters uh, in the west western part of the island and uh, western Labrador is also in for some uh, heavy snowfall about 15 to 20 centimeters uh, we're looking at for uh, the Avalon and eastern parts of the island and then you see the switch over uh, to rain Friday morning so about 15 to 25 millimeters of rain expected with that system so yeah it's going to be pretty significant with all of those winds uh, and all of that rain it's going to be quite a nasty day and you can see how that snowfall is just hovering over Labrador so that's going to be there for about a day and a half so lots of snow coming your way. Uh, so this is the picture for Friday. Rain and wind, as I mentioned, just look at those temperatures. Just amazing. This warm front moving in, boosting up the temperatures to six degrees plus six. Can you imagine? 
and uh, unfortunately we have all that mess to go along with it, but uh, at least it will be a little bit milder. Uh, two degrees on uh, the west coast there, staying very, very chilly in western Labrador, minus 15 on Friday with all of that snowfall. And as we get into the weekend, some more flurries expected for the eastern parts of the island. Uh, lots of flurries throughout the week. A little bit of a break here for central Newfoundland, minus 7 degrees on uh, Sunday. And for Labrador, things, uh, you know, they, they warm up a little bit for this Friday and Saturday, and then it just drops right back down as uh, the work week begins in those frigid, frigid, double-digit minus temperatures. So as we mentioned earlier, the loop is a hot spot when the temperatures drop and despite a slow start right, at the skating stop. track it's now picking up and here now Jeremy Eaton has been hanging out at the loop all day today and we're gonna head back to him so Jeremy how's it looking out your way uh, the loop is actually starting to fill up with a lot of people as we know uh, school is not in session right now so there are a lot of kids with a lot of free time so they're out enjoying the loop now earlier today we said it is a bit rough out here but that hasn't deterred the people from coming and there must be more than 100 people out here today and one of them is this young man named Benjamin Mugford. Benjamin, how are you doing today, buddy? Good. What are you doing here at the Loop today? I'm skating. And uh, do you like skating? Yeah. So I understand that you just started playing hockey. How long have you been playing hockey for? Mm, a couple of months. And uh, how, have, is this your first time skating here at the Loop? No, I understand you've skated here before, is that correct? Yes. Yes. And uh, what's the best part about skating for you, Benjamin? Playing hockey. Playing hockey. Who's your favorite team, Benjamin? Um, Boston, Boston Bruins? <laughs> yeah. Well, Benjamin, I appreciate your time. Thanks so much for chatting to me today. And uh, I can let you get out and go back and enjoy the skating, which I think is a lot more fun than chatting to an old man, Jeremy Eaton. But anyway, that's Benjamin Mugford, my buddy who I just met here at the Loop. He's one of many children skating around here at the Bannerman Park in St. John's. And so I'm going to uh, throw it back to you guys in the studio and try to warm up my feet because they're freezing from standing out here for the last hour and a half. So reporting live for Here and Now, I'm Jeremy Eaton at Bannerman Park in St. John's. Well, perhaps he should be skating. He should have his skates on. Or he needs to go and get himself a hot chocolate from, they've got that little hut set up right next door. So, you know, if he's feeling a little bit cold. Yeah, absolutely. Great to see so many kids wearing helmets, though, absolutely. Uh, when they're out skating. And it's not mandatory down there. We were talking about that earlier today in, a, in one of our meetings. Doesn't mean it's not still not a good they, idea, though. It, it, they advise it for sure, obviously. Absolutely. To, to be safe. Well, it's the first day back to work for many across the country, and some Nova Scotians have a whale of a tale for those back for their holiday adventure. About 100 people turned up to help a pilot whale stranded at a, a Halifax beach. CBC's Carolyn Ray has the story. Minus 20 degrees with the wind chill wasn't going to stop these volunteers doing everything they can to save a life. From digging to holding up a tarp, this community lined up on the beach to help the dying whale. I saw somebody post on a Facebook group that there was a beached whale and they were looking for help, so got in the truck and drove out. Injured from thrashing around in the sand, they had to move fast. Professional marine rescuers arrived on the scene and got the heavy animal onto a raft. It's unusual for a pilot whale to be by itself. They're an extremely social species, so when we get st single stranded animals, um, it is always a concern that there's an underlying health issue. They thought they'd need a boat, but with all these extra hands, it wasn't needed. A human chain formed with rescuers, firefighters, even passers by with their dogs stopped to help, pulling the whale back to the icy water. That's a pretty amusing experience. It's pretty cool to see all kinds of people just helping and doing anything they can to save this, this mammal that could potentially live or die. Back in the water, but not out of the woods. The tide was out and it was too shallow for the pilot whale to swim, so they helped along, repeatedly pushing the whale off sandbars as it got stuck on the way, never leaving its side. Why not? Yeah, I don't know. Why would you not help? Finally, after nearly 30 minutes in the water by the rescuers, the whale started swimming on its own, leaving them hopeful that this community effort saved a life. Carolyn Ray, CBC News, Rainbow Haven Beach, Nova Scotia. Well, new technology is helping a Nova Scotia woman reclaim her voice. Jolyn Huntley suffered a catastrophic brain injury when she was 15, leaving her unable to communicate. 
As the CDC's Tom Murphy reports, special software is changing that. I saw you looking at your snowboard. It's all in the eyes. See those tiny movements? A special camera on Joellen Huntley's tablet oh, tracks them. No, the white dead. dot, that represents the reflection from her eyes. The software reads their movement, matches it with the pre-programmed images. What do you want to wear today, Joe? For more than 21 years, Joellen has not spoken. Now this. I want to wear a long-sleeved shirt. It's what Joellen Huntley's family believes is finally meaningful communication. I put a song on and I danced around the computer with a chair with her. Joellen Huntley was a teenager when she suffered severe brain injury in a car accident back in 1996. Trapped in her own body, Joellen's speech pathologist believes she now has a voice. For right now, she's using pictures to communicate. Um, there are alphabet boards built into her system where she could eventually go in and spell um, a specific message on her own or choose a pre-programmed message. Here's the thing. This isn't the first time that perseverance has paid off for Joellen Huntley and her family. Just a few years ago, they had to go to court to battle the provincial government when it tried to claw back the insurance payments of close to $1.5 million. They said it was to compensate taxpayers who pay for her care. After public outrage, the province dropped the case and negotiated a confidential deal with the family. Some of that money went to buy this technology, which has been around for about a decade and has been used by patients across Canada. She's shooting for the stars, everything, anything's possible now. It's not clear how much more it will help Joellen, but hope is a word people around here are using a lot these days. Tom Murphy, CBC shirt. News, Waterville, Nova Scotia. At least 25 people have died after a bus fell off a cliff in Peru. Local officials say the bus carrying more than 50 people careened off the road after being hit by a tractor trailer. It is feared that the death toll may be more as the bus fell 80 meters before landing on a beach below. A much happier ending to this story. The U.S. Coast Guard had to spring into action to save a man from a sinking car. That's right. Coast Guard crew just happened to be refueling at a Florida marina when the 89-year-old man drove his car right into the bay. They had to break the car window to pull him out to safety. Talk about being in the right place at the right time. And here's today's viewer picture of the day. Just a beautiful shot of last night's super moon. Not too hard to guess where this picture was taken. A few clues in there for sure, but uh, I'll have the answer coming up in a couple of minutes. I think I know Carolyn. <laughs> Can I drop a hint? Pick me. Pick me. John Give Effort. <laughs> That's a good hint. <laughs>
Welcome back to Here Now. Winter weather may have put a damper on the power lines. But it sure makes for a pretty picture, that's for sure. These are some photographs taken and a video from the uh, Fraser Valley in BC where the great He's got outdoors. a snopsicle. <laughs> Sorry, you can continue now. Okay, somebody get him a tissue <laughs> and a filter for Peter. <laughs> Uh, take it in the Fraser Valley in BC. Hey man, this is my first week. <laughs> Ease up. It's icy there. Take it to. Uh, <laughs> yeah, there were some trees that were tipped over from the weight of all that new ice that was coating all those trees. <laughs> and it is indeed pretty cold in most of the country right now. Uh, here is an example of how cold it's been in Calgary. Yeah, it was cold enough to make ice bubbles. A local photographer spent part of his Christmas holidays outside freezing and photographing these ice bubbles. He created this work of art using a straw with a mixture of uh, cornstarch, dish soap and salt. The video has gone viral with more than 200,000 views. A lot of people with a lot of time on their hands, including <laughs> the maker of these uh, wow, homemade snow globes. That is fantastic. That is incredible that it just naturally forms like that. It's like you remember the video of the guy, I might have been in Labrador, we're throwing the uh, Water in the air, yeah, the cup, yeah. yeah, and, and just, it all just phew. freezes. Yeah. Well, I guess the good news is it won't be that cold here. No, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> We've escaped because the rest of the country, I spent some time in Ontario over Christmas and it was cold. Polar yeah. vortex. Yes. And uh, so I guess, yes, we're getting snow and rain, but we're at least get escaping the cold. Yeah, to look at the least on the island. I can't say the same for the poor folks in Western Labrador. It's but it's just, January in Western Labrador. Yeah. Yeah, they're they're fine. And if they're you don't like right? it, wait five minutes. It'll change. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so we we showed you uh, the viewer picture of the day right before the break. I just love this shot, and uh, yeah, I think everyone pretty much knows where this was taken in beautiful Port de Grave. Mm. So just lovely. That super moon last night. Incredible shot of that. It looks like a huge star. Tis the season. It is. Well, like a picture over uh, like the star over Bethlehem or something, you know, mm -hmm. but it's Port it Grave, the lighting of the uh, fishing vessels, yeah, so, an uh, annual event out there. Thank you very much to Connie Wesley Duffett for uh, posting that on Ryan's Facebook page. Just a great shot. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And today was just a great day, at least here in the east. It was. We got the three things. It was mild temperatures, mm -hmm. it was sunny, and there wasn't much wind. Yep. And great dog walking day. I wish that's what I was that? doing today. And, and no of course, we're all back to work today, so. Yeah. And no flies. <laughs> <laughs> Good night, everyone. Good Thanks night. for watching.